What's up, everybody? It's Mover C.W. Lemoyne. If you're looking for a quarantine reading uh, box set, so to speak, the Spectre Series box set, it's only 99 cents. That's $1 for four books for the next uh, couple days, so till the end of April. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Pick that up. Uh, leave a review. It helps support the channel. Today, we are talking about uh, a headline in the news, uh, how an F-16 fighter jet accidentally bombed Japan. So that sounds pretty... Whew, yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look. Three, two, one, fight off. So a friend of mine this weekend uh, sent me an article about how an F-16 fighter jet accidentally bombed Japan. It was on Yahoo, um, but actually written by Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, via Popular Mechanics, and the highlights are a U.S. Air Force F-16 stationed in Japan accidentally dropped a bomb on private property. The accident report blames pilot error, including channelized detention. There were no casualties or damage on the ground, and the pilot was retrained and eventually placed back on duty. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. If you go to the Popular Mechanics website, just to show you how this stuff spreads, the... Um, Popular Mechanic says how an F-16 fighter jet accidentally bombed Japan, same. And then it says, luckily, the inert laser-guided bomb fell unexplosively onto private property. Now, in fairness, the popular or the Yahoo um, article does eventually say that it was inert, uh, that it was an inert bomb, I think, somewhere in here. They dropped a bomb on Japan. It was on private property. They released the accident report this week. That's why we're doing this. It actually happened November 6, 2019. Pilot error caused a GBU-12 laser-guided bomb to strike the wrong target. Flying a training mission, accidentally sent the GBU-12 to the target location. He believed the, another F-16 was spotting for him. Instead, the bomb was sent to a location 3.4 miles away. No damage to property and no one injured. The GBU-12 Paveway 2 is a 500-pound bomb fitted with a laser seeker and control fins to guide the bomb to the target. The releasing aircraft, other aircraft, drone, or other unit will paint the target with a laser beam. Laser-guided bombs like the Paveway 2 are considered smart bombs, but are only smart, only as smart as the targeting data. In this case, a report explains, the pilot was flying a nighttime suppression of enemy air defense seed mission and was cleared to drop an inert. Oh, there we go. Finally. So it only took one, two, three, four paragraphs for them to finally say that it was an inert bomb whereas popular mechanics says yep luckily the inert laser guided bomb unexplosively on a private property uh and they basically say the same thing so it's the same article it's just popular mechanics is at least good enough to say hey it was inert in the title this actually comes from uh is you know it's like don't copy my homework the, the, he actually talks about the article he refers back to the Air Force article, which is titled AIB, Inert Bomb Dropped on Private Property Near Masawa Due to Pilot Error. So, okay, enough of the high horse. Let's look at the actual accident report because all of this is BS. The highlights for what actually happened. Uh, essentially, they were on a night seed mission. It was supposed to be a two ship of strikers. So they were gonna do, it was an upgrade ride, suppre suppression of enemy air defense. Uh, night upgrade ride. It was the two ship of strikers. They were going to drop inert, so it's 500 pound concrete bombs with uh, GBU 12 seekers on it, so it simulates that. They were going to drop the bombs and then egress out with the upgrade E protecting his two ship. They get to the, uh, the range, weather is bad, so he has another two ship that he's like, hey, you get below the weather, you laze it, and I'll uh, drop. Well, he tags, we'll talk about. Uh, the sensor point of interest, but he thinks he's tagging the sensor point of interest of the lasing bomb. Instead, he's tagging someone else's sensor point of interest, which is three miles off range. He drops on that bomb. The inert bomb travels off range and lands in the dirt. Thankfully, no one was hurt. No one was injured. The Japanese were a little upset because it was a nighttime thing and the uh, squadron waited till the next day to let the Japanese government know that they had had uh, an unintentional release, which is what this is called. When it's off range, it's unintentional. Okay, so uh, a little bit of background about how this works. Anytime there's a mishap, uh, two boards convene. One is a safety investigation board, SIB. 
Safety investigation boards have what's called safety privilege. And the reason for that is when something happens, the goal of a safety investigation board is to find out what went wrong, how we can fix it, and then disseminate that to the rest of the Air Force or Navy. And the reason that's important is because when you have safety privilege, you're more likely to talk about things and admit to mistakes and stuff like that. There's no criminal, criminal prosecution possibilities or anything like that of an SIB. It's all confidential and it's all meant for safety. And AIB is convened in conjunction with that, and that is what is released to the public, and that is where criminal prosecutions can happen, that is where blame is placed, that is uh, publicly available. So every mishap that has ever happened, you can find this report if you want to go to the source document and see exactly what the AIB found and whether there was criminal prosecutions or whether they who they blamed, that's where the blame happens is in the AIB. Now, we talked about it a little bit in the French uh, Rafale uh, inadvertent eject ejection or premature ejection. And I, that was, I, if the French do it the same way as we do, it was the AIB. So you didn't see the SIB. And the SIB includes all the transcripts. It includes all the safety privileged information that only the squadrons are meant to see. The AIB is more public. But this gives a good summary of what happened. And like I said, you can go to the website and find it yourself and read the report. So this is the AIB report. PACAF wrote it. 14th Fighter Squadron, 35th uh, Fighter Wing at Misawa in Japan. There's a nice picture. So here's what happened. On 6 November 2019, F-16 Charlie Mike, so uh, the newer, like kind of like what's in DCS, Block 50. Uh, they released an inert GB-12 that impacted the range outside of the uh, range, a U.S. government, uh, the Drahan range. Uh, U.S. government minister bombing range 15 miles north of the Mishap Air Base, uh, Misawa. And the mishap aircraft was flying with six other aircraft on a night suppression of enemy air defense flight lead upgrade sortie. GB-12 impacted a private property near the northern edge of Lake Ogawara. Oh, God. Uh, Lake Ogawara. There were no deaths or injuries, no damage to government property or private structures. Obviously, the dirt was upset. At a mass mission brief, the pilot deploying the GB-12 in question, the mishap pilot, was informed his aircraft would be carrying an inert GB-12 and that if the mission and weather allowed, he should employ the weapon during the sortie. The mishap, mishap pilot discussed the range restrictions and planned the attack with his wingman. Later, he learned that he'd be flying as a single ship. So basically what happened is they briefed as an eight ship, and then he briefed, he was supposed to be the striker. So he and his wingman were gonna be the two ship, ship of strikers. The flight lead upgrade was going to be the seed mission and they were gonna protect him as he uh, did his simulated strike. When he gets to step or prior to step or somewhere in between the brief and going to the airplane, they say, hey, we only have seven jets. And so uh, he decides the wingman's gonna fall out and he's gonna be the single ship striker. Later, the, uh, during the sortie, the MP tried twice to drop the weapon on the tactical target at the range, but was unable due to a scattered layer of clouds that obscured the target. So with an LGB, laser guided bomb, uh, the seeker has to have guidance. It has to find the laser, otherwise it just falls ballistically. So um, typically you need, in the last portion of its guidance, you need someone to laser it. So he tried, but when there's clouds obscuring it, the laser can't go through it because the targeting pod can't see the target. So uh, he obviously couldn't drop. And you might ask, why would we just drop pieces of concrete? Because that's what an inert bomb is. When you go out and you just use symbology, that is good systems training. It's switchology training, it's good like that. However, you don't get the sensations of losing 500 pounds off of a wing, you know, the, the slight wing rock. You don't get the watching the bomb actually impact to see where it actually would hit. It is much more beneficial for training to see an actual live bomb or piece of concrete hit. They, that was the intent. So they can see where the bomb hit. They can do a, a debrief on that and an analysis of kind of how he did with the lays and all that stuff, simulating real world. But you need to be able to laze the bomb. They had scatter, scatter clouds that just couldn't do it. After the vulnerability period was done and the primary training complete, so basically they knocked off the, the war or the fight or whatever, they're already done. This is more of an administrative drop. Now they just want to practice getting the bomb off the jet. After that, He's talking to another two ship, Shenzo 1, Shenzo 2, and based on the observed weather and the range, he concluded that the other two ship could get below the weather and lays his bomb as it's what's called a buddy lays. So we can, you know, as long as it's the same laser code as what's programmed in the bomb, 
you can lay someone else's bomb is. You can also do it by ground observer. SO-1 and SO-2, which is the Shinzo flight, were able to visually acquire the target and inform the mishap pilot that they could guide his weapon. So they're like, yep, we're, we're tally the target. We know exactly uh, what you're bombing. We've got the coordinates, so copy that. We'll laze it in. While his attack run, the MP asked SO-1 to transmit his sensor point of interest, SPI, which is located at the tactical target. At around 9.35 Zulu, SO-1 con communicated that he was transmitting the SPI. At this point, the mishap pilot selected symbology believed corresponded to that SPI. However, the SPI he selected was approximately 3.5 miles, 3.4 miles from the correct target. The MP communicated that he had captured so the SO-1's SPI and continued his attack run. SO-1 acknowledged and both the mishap pilot and SO-1 failed to confirm that the SPI sent to SO-1 was the SPI received in the mishap pilot's aircraft at 937, believing that he was on the right target. He pickled and the GBU-12 flew ballistically to the SPI in the, the wrong, basically somewhere off the off range. Action board determined that the cause was pilot error, concluded that a failure of communication during an assisted weapons deployment procedure caused the mishap pilot to fail to confirm the SPI he had selected was the target to which other formation was guiding the weapon. Substantially contributing factors includes channelized attention, changing weather, targeting technical error. So let's be clear. It was nighttime, which nighttime makes it more difficult, NVGs and all that stuff. It just adds a layer of complexity. His wingman had fallen out, so that was a change. So something, you know, it's always an error chain. It's a Swiss cheese model, right? And as soon as they line up, that's when bad things start to happen. And if it's not broken, if that chain's not broken, you get things like this. So um, nighttime, wingman falls out, goes to the range, weather's a factor, can't drop, tries multiple, time, multiple times. Now he's probably getting low on fuel, wants to get the bomb off, has this sense of urgency. Now he's finally got a plan. Other aircraft is lazing. He quickly hooks the SPI, the sensor point of interest, does not confirm that it's the actual target, does not notice that it's outside the airspace because we have airspace lines. I don't know how the, the Block 50s are, but I'm pretty sure they do. And then releases and 3.4 miles, depending on your scale on the display, you won't even notice that because I mean, if you're on a 50 mile or 100 mile scope or whatever, you won't see that it's outside the airspace. You have to zoom in and he might not have, I don't know. I mean, I'm not gonna try to sit here and guess. That's the summary. So it goes into summary of facts. This is the, the big summary what we just talked about, the background, uh, mission, scheduled for a two ship, two ship strike formation, support of night seed flug ride. Uh, eight aircraft total, four in the flight, two strikers, and two adversaries. So it was a 6v2. Um, so he, he had to fight two F-16s acting as red air, which is something I usually do. The planning, mission brief, all the pilots would be flying in the mission. Uh, the, they talked about the weather, so he probably knew there might be scattered clouds, so he's kind of worried about that. Uh, and then they talked about the GBU-12. He attended the uh, coronation brief, which is just the, the, the mass brief, if you will. Uh, and then after this, he continued his two ship attack briefing. They talked about the range and attack restrictions. So, uh, range restrictions. Every time I've ever dropped anywhere, when you're dropping simulated, there's obviously no range restrictions as long as you stay on the range physically within the confines of the airspace. When you're dropping ordnance, when stuff is coming off your aircraft, there is a range regulation and there are certain restrictions that you have to comply with. Like there are run in headings you have to do. There are certain altitudes you have to drop within, like no higher than this, no lower than this. And that's because they have computed the ballistics of whatever weapon you're talking about and determined that if you inadvertently, you know, if you don't laze it for whatever reason, it never captures. If it flies ballistically, this is as far as it'll go and not fly off range and not damage property. So there's a, a comprehensive range guide that they have to comply with. So they briefed that and they talked about that. It's also in your in-flight guide typically because this is a known range. This is not like they were going out somewhere they've never been. I mean, this is local training. So pre-flight, the op suit briefed the crews prior to stepping to that there was only seven of eight aircraft. So they did this at step. This is when this happened. Decision was made to send the mishap pilot single ship to get the tra training he needed and the wingman was kicked out of the formation. Everything was standard after that point. This tells you what the uh, Paveway 2 is, aerial laser guided bomb based on the Mark 82. It's 500 pound GP bomb with the addition of a nose mounted laser seeker and fence for guidance. Um, it had no explosive material. Internal cavity is filled with inert filler, basically concrete. The weather was forecast uh, around the target area, broken uh, six to 8,000 feet above sea level. So. 
It's, it's right in the middle of where he needs to be lasing because that's the end game of the bomb. The bomb needs to be able to see the laser point. Observed weather was scattered to broken, so it was a little bit better than what it was forecast. Four to 8,000 over land with clear over the sea. Uh, mishap pilot was a flight lead. Uh, he had been flying recently. I mean, nine flights within 30 days is pretty good. No training deficiencies. All crew members trained performance. Everything looked good. Medical was fine. Ops tempo, nothing. So it wasn't like they were busy or, or you know, it was, it was something else. Uh, supervision, they said, yep, everything was good. Human factors, okay, so this is where they get human factors. Procedures not performed correctly. It was rushed or delayed, judgment, decision making, environmental conditions, okay, the clouds, standard and proper terminology. Uh, so that's why 3 1 com or ALSA com is now so important because you want to all make sure you're talking the same language and actually on the same page and you all understand what's going on. Known uh, or suspected deviations. So he was supposed to ensure accurate receipt and entry of target coordinates confirmed with a readback. He didn't do that. Uh, and then have an end call uh, prior to that. So make sure it's all correct prior to that. Use, use all means available to verify the, the target was accurate. Um, abort criteria, yep, they have that. And then target identification, you should have positively identified the target prior to weapons release. All right, so here's the opinion of the cause. So this is what the board president says. Basically, the mishap was caused by his failure to identify that the SPI selected was in fact the authorized target that was located inside the range for GBU-12 attacks. In particular, when cloud cover prevented the mishap pilot from visually guiding his GBU-12 to the correct target, and by visually, that includes the targeting pod. That's also considered visually. He relied on another pilot to identify and lock onto the target. When the identified target was transmitted to the mishap pilot for bomb drop, the mishap pilot and the pilot pilot who identified the target did not use the standard communication to confirm that the correct target was selected. Confirm code capture clearance is the four C's. He performed the action too quickly, causing him to make a mistake. The ultimate cause was pilot error. So, you know, you go too fast, you rush, this is what happened. Contributing factors. Channelized attention of the mishap pilot of his aircraft tactical display as he made repeated attempts to release. So he's getting frustrated. He's just, all he's focused on is just getting this bomb off. Uh, in accordance with the range regulations, and that's what I was talking about, in accordance with the range regulations, you have certain restrictions that funnel you in. You have to release on certain headings. You have to be at certain altitudes. It's not just you can willy-nilly go whatever direction you, that, that you want, even if the weather is, like even if it had been clear to the north and they had a run-in restriction that they can't go north, north to south or something like that then you just bring the bomb home. So the range has specific restrictions and you have to comply with them. This channelized attention led to a breakdown communication between the mishap pilot and the mishap instructor pilot that normally would have allowed them to ensure that each other's aircraft systems had the same target and identify prior to weapons release. Had communication not deteriorated, the mishap pilot might have been aware of the incorrect target. Contributing factor number two, weather that occluded the target area prevented the mishap pilot's own ship targeting pod from seeing the target. Mishap pilot twice tried to drop the weapon on a tactical target at the range we could not due to a scattered layer of clouds that obscured the target. Additionally, the sortie took place after sunset, so it was substantially in the darkness. All these elements led to the mishap pilot rely on another pilot to identify the target. Under ordinary circumstances, mishap pilot would visually identify the target to himself. And then substantially contributing factor three, spuriously generated SPI coincided with the mishap mishap pilot's request for the MIP, our mishap IP, to send SPI of the target prior to weapons release. Neither the mishap pilot nor any of the other pilots were airborne at the time it was in his vicinity created the SPI. Absent such an SPI, there would likely have been no confusion. So what happened, um, and honestly, I don't understand it. I'm more of an old school F-16 guy. We didn't really use this. I mean, it's possible, but what happened was the first F-16 said, hey, send me your See me your data link. So the lazing aircraft, when he's looking with his targeting pod, his aircraft generates a sensor point of interest. So it says, hey, this is what I'm looking at. Here are the coordinates. And he can send that over the link, the data link. So he sends that across the link and the other aircraft can now hook it or tag it or whatever and lock on to that. And he pulls up the coordinates and that's what he's looking at. So, and that's, that usually helps refine to make sure we're both looking at the same thing. So he did. And, but at the same time that he thought that that was happening, sometimes if somebody's in auto or, or there's some, uh, when they talk about spurious contacts, another SPI showed up on this mishap pilot's display just out of nowhere. 
And so with, with technology, because technology fails, some little, um, you know, either someone else was transmitting or something in the system failed and added another SPI three miles off the range. So he was in a hurry because all this stuff had happened, you know, he's in a rush, you know, he's probably lower on fuel, stuff like that. He tags that one, not realizing it's the wrong one. They don't co confirm the coordinates between each other. They don't use standard com, they're in a hurry. He drops the bomb just to get the bomb off and the rest is now a mishap report. So, um, did the did they bomb the Japanese? Well, no more than they bomb the Japanese every time they drop a bomb on the range. I mean, it's you're not bombing the Japanese when you drop bomb. <laughs> First of all, what is an inert bomb? It's like dropping a wing tank. I mean, there's nothing to it. It's just a seeker con connected to concrete. Second, uh, just because it fell off range, it was an accident. They didn't bomb the Japanese. It's just a stupid title. Finally, um, my opinion, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to be educated because I haven't flown the Block 50. My biggest questions that have come out of this, obviously, you know, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what was going on. So it's, I'm not gonna, you know, sit here and, and, and point the finger or anything. But my question was, it's a range, right? So um, it's not a moving target. It's not something that changes. They have specific targets that are authorized to drop these bombs on because it's a, it's a government range. So why didn't he just drop on the coordinates that he had in his in-flight guide? Why didn't he just, you know, say, hey, we're going to drop on target 10. You know, we both have the coordinates, good to go, pickle. Like, I don't understand the need for the SPI. And Gonky and I were actually talking about this. You know, when you grow up with older systems and you're not used to all the technology, you don't rely on it versus younger pilots that all they have is the technology. They kind of get themselves into the drool cup is what it's called, where they'll try to, you know, always use the technology. And then when something goes wrong, it kind of gets them in a bind. So I don't know if that's what happened. I just, I don't understand the reason for, for using the SPI. I know, I mean, obviously sometimes you want to just practice with the systems and stuff, but I think if he'd have just dropped on the, the coordinates, everything would have been fine because even if they hadn't lased it in, it would have fallen ballistically within the range confines and that wouldn't have been a problem. He wouldn't have known that. The second was what was his display looking at that he was, you know, so zoomed out that he didn't see that the point was off range. Um, but I mean, okay, that's, that's valid. I mean, if you're in a hurry, I can see, you know, it's just a mistake. That's all it is. And then third, at that point, you know, night knowing that, and I think that's probably experienced, you know, this he's a four ship flight lead, but I don't know that he really might have that experience. But at that point, why not just bring the bomb home? You know, I mean, it, if it's just training, you know, if you're, if you're starting to get complicated with your plan at that point, you just go, look, I'm going to, I'm going to bring the bomb home. We'll just, we'll do it again because there's nothing landing wise that would prevent them from bringing that bomb home. It's not a weight issue or anything like that. He could have just brought the bomb home and they would have downloaded it and used it another time. So those are my questions. Again, I'm not, I wasn't there. I'm not gonna, um, you know, I'm not gonna trash the guy. He, he obviously did what he thought was best and he made an honest mistake and that's what happens. He didn't hurt anybody. It was just some dirt and, you know, other than the fact that it made Yahoo News, it's really not a huge deal. This stuff happens. You know, we train and we make mistakes and then we get better. Anyway, that's what really happened. Uh, I, I really wanna stress that when stuff like this happens, the source document is where you need to go, not just Yahoo News or whatever, because you can see Yahoo News says we bombed Japan. Popular Mechanic says, we bombed Japan, but it actually was inert, so no big deal. And then you go to the actual Air Force website and it says, the AIB's out, an inert bomb fell off range, and here's why. And then you go to the AIB and it says, well, there were some switchology errors, there's some channelized attention, there's some task saturation, there's some stuff that led to this, and here's how we learn from it, but you know, it's just pilot error and we'll, we'll live to fight another day. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, let me know in the comments if you want me to do more uh, breakdowns like this, because uh, we can all learn. I think this is all good uh, learning uh, potential for everybody. So thanks for watching, we'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! I've a lot of them. Usually fine with the doors off. Don't be a douche. Rule number one. I can tell you now.